Section 20 of Birds and Nature, Volume 11, Number 3, March 1902. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Evangeline Barham. The Spring Migration, 1. The Warblers. In two former papers, I told you of some of the birds that spend their winters in the Gulf states. It is my purpose in the present article to tell some of the features of the great spring migration as viewed from a Mississippi standpoint. How myriads of the little fellows in yellow, black, white, and olive green stop in these forests to rest and feed for a day or two, then, under the impulse of a little understood instinct, continue their journey to the region of their birth. The migration takes place in successive waves till the last one breaks upon us and spring is over. In early March, the first wave rolls in upon us. Happy little creatures hop about and chatter among the opening buds and feast on the insect life awakened by the returning sun. On successive days, or perhaps at intervals of a few days, other waves roll in from the far lands of the Gulf and the Caribbean Sea, till the final one beats against these hills, and we awake about the first of May to realize that summer, fervid, tropical, is here. For the months of March and April, all is bustle among the feathered traveling public. After that, the summer residents have things all their own way till the fall migration begins. As the sun draws near the line, you notice that up in the tops of the gum trees are little birds about the size of a savanna sparrow and viewed hastily of much the same coloring. You know they are not savannas because the savanna never frequents such places. Some of them have probably spent their winter in this latitude but just now, by their restless activity, they tell us that the sap has begun to stir and that the great migration is about to begin. Closer inspection with a good glass will show four spots or patches of yellow, one on the crown, one under each wing, and another on the rump, hence the bird's name, the yellow-rumped warbler, sometimes known as the myrtle warbler. A month later, you will scarcely recognize the males of this species, the dull brown of the winter coat being replaced by the shiny black of his bridegroom's suit. When the beech buds swell and the jessamine puts forth its little yellow trumpets to announce that spring has actually come, the first great wave comes flooding into the awakening woods. Here come the first arrivals, both sexes in coats of grayish blue, with shirt waists of brilliant yellow, the male distinguished by a patch of rufous of an irregular crescent shape across the lower part of the throat and upper part of the breast. On fine, sunshiny days, the parallel warbler, for that is his name, loves the topmost branches of the tallest trees. If the day is gloomy, he comes down to the lower branches, affording a better opportunity to study him. His only note at these times is an insect-like buzz, much in keeping with his diminutive size. In the lowlands, the Halesia, or silver bell, is putting out its graceful, pendulous racemes of purest white, and it is time to look for the next migrant, the hooded warbler, one of the largest and finest of his race. A V of brilliant yellow coming down to the bill, covering the forehead and running backwards past the eye, bordered by a well-defined band of intense black, and a back and tail of green slightly tinted with olive, make him a marked bird. Unlike the parallel, he cares nothing for treetops or sunshine. A perch on a swinging rattan vine or in a shrub in the dark woods hard by a cane break is good enough for him. As soon as the hooded warbler appears, we will see the black and white creeping warbler, the connecting link, so to speak, between the creepers and warblers in both appearance and habits. Like our common brown creeper, he loves the dense woods, but unlike him seems to prefer the tops and higher branches. Alternate patches and streaks of white and black without a suggestion of the yellow or olive green so characteristic of his genus make his identification easy. His note is simple and short. In fact, the sounds that he emits in his journeys are scarcely worth being called a song. The flood tide comes about the first of April and lasts two weeks. Prominent among the multitude of visitors, you may see a warbler slightly smaller than the hooded, but of the same general coloring, yellow, black, and green, only in this bird the black is in three patches, one on the top of the head, the others running from the bill back and down. This is the Kentucky warbler, a lover of the ground and of the low growths. 
There is another that the hasty observer might mistake for the hooded or the Kentucky, and that is the Maryland yellowthroat. The black on the latter is confined to broad bands of rich velvety black below the eyes. The yellow is more of a sulfur than a chrome shade, and the green is more nearly olive than in the two just mentioned. Many of this species make their summer home in this latitude, making their nests and rearing their broods in the mat of vines and weeds along the fence rows. The usual song is Wichity, 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 uttered with the cheerful vigor that makes the Carolina wren so attractive. During the months of April and May, 1900, I had frequent opportunities to observe two pairs of yellow throats that had built just inside the fence that parallels the railroad. The males, as they caught sight of me coming down the track, would mount the highest weed within reach and sing with all their might, but as I came opposite their perch, would drop suddenly down into the weeds and remain there till I was well past, then resume their perch and song as long as I was in hearing. Another of this family, conspicuous for its brilliant coloring, is the prothonotary warbler. Yellow breast, head, neck, and shoulders, yellowish olive wings and back, and darker olive tail render him conspicuous against any woodland background. If you want to see him during these busy April days, we must go where he is, i.e. in the cypress or willow swamps. The dark gray festoons of Spanish moss, Tillandsia usneoides, and the tender young green of the cypress leaves afford both contrast for his bright colors and provisions for his larder. Some of the species also nest here, choosing for their homes oftentimes the holes made by some of our smaller woodpeckers and dead willow stubs. I remember one morning seeing a cheerful flock of prothonotary and parallel warblers and noticing one of the former leave his companions and fly to a clump of willows where another less brilliantly colored, presumably the female, joined him. Together they inspected the willow stubs, running in and out and up and down the trunks, peering into every cavity. Finally, they found one that met their requirements, then, after a short but earnest discussion, flew away through the swamp. Inhabiting the marshes and swamps is the Louisiana water thrush, a slender brown bird shaped much like the brown thrasher, only much smaller, being about six inches in length as compared with the thrasher's eleven or twelve. A gifted singer, he is very wild and shy, always resenting the intrusion of the lords of creation upon his quiet haunts, flitting quietly on before you in the shadows, evincing his distrust of your motives by an occasional angry clink. He well illustrates the principle of compensation. Though denied the brilliant yellows and greens of his warbler brethren, he surpasses them all in the quality of his song, as free, as beautiful, as wild as the bird himself. All the individuals of the species that I saw in three years' observation were either in the water beaches Carpinus Caroliniana, that grew so thickly along the creek, or in the sweet gums and cypress along the borders of an immense swamp. As the Louisiana water thrush is the star soloist of the warbler contingent, so the yellow-breasted chat is the clown of our woodland troop. His coloring is vivid but simple, being green with a wash of olive above, lores black, breast bright chrome yellow, other underparts white or whitish. Under most circumstances, this bird is shy and difficult to approach, as I learned by personal experience, but when one of his strange moods comes upon him, perhaps it is the approach of the nuptial season that so affects him, he doffs much of his shyness and becomes a veritable clown, making such a profusion and variety of noises that one would fain believe that there is a whole score of birds in the bush or thicket from which the medley proceeds. He darts out of his retreat and flies away over the shrubbery, twisting and turning his body, raising and dropping his tail as if all his joints were of the ball and socket pattern, making as many ridiculous contortions and as many varieties of squeaks and squalls as an old-time elocutionist. Besides numerous individuals of the species of warblers already named, in the two weeks between April 9th and 23rd, I saw one or more of each of the following, yellow or summer, blue-winged, worm-eating, magnolia, golden-winged, chestnut-sided, prairie, and the red start. As I write these names, they call up mornings spent in the land of the possum and persimmon, while yet the steamy breath of the dew was going up to meet the fervor of an April sun, and all of the air was heavy with the perfume of the blooming holly. 
mornings of music from a thousand throats inspired by the new wine of the year. At such times one realizes the force of these two lines from Richard Hovey, Make me over, Mother April, when the sap begins to stir. James Stephen Compton End of section 20 This recording is in the public domain. Section 21 of Birds and Nature, Volume 11, Number 3, March 1902 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Pet Squirrel Grandma, what made those little scars on this finger? asked Nellie. Those, said Grandma reflectively, were made by a saucy little gray squirrel. How? When I was a little girly, smaller than you, Uncle gave me a gray squirrel in a cage for a pet. As we all fondled him, he soon became very tame. We often opened his cage door and allowed him to run around the house at will. One day he ran upstairs and played havoc in a feather bed. After that, when out of his cage, we kept a close watch on him, never allowing him in a bedroom. But he had already learned a new trick, which he seemed very loath to forget. Every time that he could sneak into a bedroom, he would make a beeline for the bed, tear a hole in the tick, and be inside among the feathers in a flash. As I said before, everyone around the place petted and handled him, and he had never bitten or scratched anyone. But one day, while playing with him, he suddenly leaped from my arms and raced upstairs. Just as he jumped upon a bed, I caught him. This angered his squirrelship. He turned and savagely ran his long, sharp teeth through my finger. The sores were slow about healing and left these little scars. After that, Mother would not allow me to let him out of his cage. Love Day, Almira Nelson End of section 21. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 22 of Birds and Nature, Volume 11, Number 3, March, 1902. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The English Walnut and Related Trees. Juglans Regia L. Children fill the groves with the echoes of their glee, gathering tawny chestnuts, and shouting when beside them drops the heavy fruit of the tall black walnut tree. William Cullen Bryant, the 3rd of November. The English walnut, butternut, black walnut, shagbark or shellbark hickory, mockernut or whiteheart hickory, bitternut hickory, and pignut hickory are closely related belonging to the butternut family, or, technically, the juglandacaceae. They are large handsome trees with spreading branches and clean-cut leaves. They are of comparative slow growth, but hardy and enduring. The English walnut is a tall, large, handsome tree, which undoubtedly came from India. The name walnut is from Wallish, or Welsh nut. Juglans from Jovis glands, meaning the nut of Jove and regia meaning royal hence the royal nut of jove the greeks dedicated the tree to their chief deity zeus who corresponds to the chief deity of the romans namely jove or jupiter at a greek wedding the nuts were scattered among the guests that zeus might bless the marriage the tree was described by numerous ancient writers among others by dioscorides plinius varro columella and Palladius. Medicinal and other virtues were ascribed to the fruit and leaves, and even to the shade of this remarkable tree. Arabian physicians used the hull of the unripe fruit and the leaves medicinally. Carl der Grosse, Charlemagne, recommended the cultivation of this plant in Germany about 812. It was introduced into the Mediterranean countries at an early period and extensively cultivated. From these countries it rapidly spread to northern Europe and about 1562 it found its way into the British Isles, where it is extensively cultivated. It is cultivated somewhat in the United States. 
all the other members of the juglandicaceae are common throughout the united states either growing wild or under cultivation the wood of the butternut or white walnut and that of the black walnut is extensively used in cabinet making furniture making and interior finish particularly the wood of the black walnut the earlier craze for black walnut furniture threatened to exterminate the plant but fortunately for the walnut tree the fashion is waning the wood is heavy dark brown in color of medium hardness easily worked and readily polished though it does not take the glossy polish of the harder woods as ebony hickory wood is very hard tough and durable but it is not suitable for cabinet making etc because it warps too much it is an excellent wood for making handles for tools of all descriptions oxen yokes hoops walking sticks whiffle trees wagon stocks etc its tensile strength is enormous being said to be equal to that of wrought iron the seeds kernels of the english walnut butternut black walnut and shagbark hickory are edible and greatly relished while those of the bitter and pignut hickories are not edible eating too many of the kernels causes distressing dyspeptic symptoms because of the large amount of oil which they contain salting the kernels before eating or taking a little salt with them is said to lessen these disturbances the oil of these nuts is expressed and used as a salad oil and by artists in mixing pigments the half-grown green fruits of the walnuts are pickled with spices and eaten but as such relishes have never come into great favor they are too severe in their action on the intestinal tract due to the tannin acids and coloring substances present the hulls of these nuts are used in dyeing cloth also the bark of the butternut and black walnut the leaves and hull of the english walnut and the inner bark of the roots of the butternut are still quite extensively used medicinally a decoction of the leaves is said to cure gout scrofula and rickets the hulls are recommended in gout and eruptive skin diseases fresh leaves are applied as a fomentation to carbuncles the extract is used as a gargle, wash for ulcerous eruptions, and taken internally in tubercular meningitis. The juice of the green hull has been extensively employed as a popular remedy to remove warts, as an external application for skin diseases, and internally as a stomachic and worm remedy. The medicinal virtues of these plants are, however, apparently limited and unreliable the nut so called of the english walnut black walnut butternut and hickory nut consists of the kernel seed and the inner layer endocarp of the fruit coat pericarp the endocarp which is ordinarily designated as the shell is very hard and splits more or less easily into two equal parts the shell of the english walnut is comparatively thin and quite easily removed from the kernel the shell of the black walnut and butternut is very rough very dark in color thick and not so easily removed from the cedar kernel the hickory shell is quite difficult to remove the kernels are eaten direct or added to cake cake frosting and other pastry or encased by sugar and chocolate by the candy maker the halves of the shell of the english walnut figure conspicuously in the well-known shell game of the gambler who seems to be the central figure at county fairs and many circuses as already stated the trees belonging to the butternut or hickory nut family grow quite slowly and do not attain their full growth for many years in our latitude the nuts are planted in the fall when they begin to germinate late the following spring in order to give the trees free growth they should be planted at least thirty feet apart they begin to bear fruit at about the tenth year few nuts at first but gradually more and more each year and they continue to bear for many years the leaves buds and green fruits have a resinous characteristic aromatic odor recalling the lemon all who have ever handled leaves green bark and fruit will remember that the juice colors the skin a dark brown which is very difficult to remove the fruit of the black walnut and butternut when ripe is gathered the hulls removed by stamping with mauls the nuts dried for a week in the sun and then stored for use the hull of the English walnut and the hickory nut is quite easily removed. Albert Schneider. End of section twenty two. Recording by Philip Gould.
Section 23 of Birds and Nature, Volume 11, Number 3, March 192. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Awakening. My heart is glad, and hopes deemed dead now wake to life again. This morn I heard, ere I to conscious thought returned had, the spring song of the sparrows and the rain. M. Townsend Maltby. End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. End of Birds and Nature, Volume 11, Number 3, March 1902.